Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm George Binns, and I'm here with my co-host, Gail Burke. And before we get into our show tonight, Gail has a top of the page. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wanted to talk about something that got me very upset this week, and it has to do with Dr. Seuss and the Cat in the Hat books. Uh, the left seems to delight in finding racism wherever it does or does not exist. Dr. Seuss and his Cat in the Hat books are the latest victims of a politically correct, absurd attempt by quote-unquote educators to indoctrinate little children into believing that Mer America is a hateful, racist country. Of course, the real prejudice exists in the eyes of those who can still cannot accept that, that Donald Trump is the President of the United States. The attacks on our President also include insults to his wife and family. The question has to be, were the haters, where were the haters when Barack and Michelle Obama were reading to children and praising the Cat in the Hat books a few years ago? No one accused them of being racist. So now we have a teacher slash librarian in Cambridge who is doing just that. Progressives will stop at nothing to rewrite our history and diminish our rich culture, even when it comes to destroying amazing literature that is innocent, fun, and is a great tool for teaching young children to read. The book burners are still alive and well. Isn't it time to toss political correctness in the trash heap where it belongs and bring back common sense? Well, thinking about uh, Dr. Seuss and the Cat in the Hat, you get into a lot of the kids' stuff. And that's what we want to talk about tonight is uh, a little more fun things. The uh, theme of tonight's show is theme parks. And could you roll the uh, first clip, please? For decades, amusement parks have been a staple of American summers, from the scent of fried sugar to stomach-churning rides. There's just something about them that brings out the kid in us. Is there anything more fun than a roller coaster ride? If it is, I haven't, I haven't met it yet. Well, as you can see, uh, our guest tonight is an expert on theme parks and roller coasters and all that fun stuff, uh, Arthur Levine. Thanks for joining us, Arthur. It's my pleasure. <clears throat> well, that particular clip showed a little bit about uh, what you do um, hanging around a theme park. What else goes on after you uh, make a visit? Well, I visit theme parks all over the country, all around the world. And uh, a lot of people think that um, sort of the job begins and ends at the theme park. But then uh, I have to go back to my office here in Beverly and write articles and, um, and, and uh, do reviews and make sense out of all of the things that, I, that I've seen. And uh, then my articles are published um, mostly in USA Today and also in uh, TripSavvy, which is an online, um, an online uh, information site. And, uh, and other places as well. So I've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, I'm a, I'm a yeah. theme park journalist writing about theme parks and the amusement industry. Sounds like a wonderful job. How in the world did you get into it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great job. Um, and it's, um, I certainly didn't take a conventional route. I, um, it's, it's just something that I've always had a passion for. And um, I, it, I, I've lived here in in Massachusetts my entire life and as a kid I used to love going to the old parks most of which don't exist anymore such as Revere Beach and Pleasure Island and Salisbury Beach and um, like most kids I fell in love with these places but unlike most kids perhaps as they grow older I just never <laughs> lost the love and always uh, just, just had a fascination and always wanted to find a way that I could get involved in the industry uh, some way, and, and I've always sort of had a knack for writing, so that was kind of my entree into uh, getting involved in the industry. Now, are you employed by anyone in the industry, or are you a freelance? 
No, uh, I'm, I'm a freelance writer, writer. Okay. Uh, writing for USA Today and the mm -hmm. other some other publications that I mentioned, and uh, that's only part of what I do. It's about, about about half of my job is 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 this. I also am a writer and uh, uh, design brochures and and flyers and do writing for companies based here in in the area that have nothing to do with theme parks. So it's about half and half. Do you, do you actually go on the rides? Absolutely. <laughs> I couldn't write about them if I didn't actually go on them. That's, I can that's, see you on the roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the joy. I also, uh, I'm, I'm in the maddening throes of middle age, and yet I've, um, unlike most people, I still have the ability to go on spinning rides. A lot of people my age and younger just uh, can't do that anymore, but I seem to have a, a, an iron constitution, so that's great. I'm I still able relate. to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, the other thing that came out of one of the videos you sent us uh, was a little bit of background as to where these theme parks came from. And that one, I know you didn't have a lot of involvement in that particular shot, but it just fascinated me. So could you roll the second clip, please? The park is now filled with traditional rides and games. But back when it was founded, 434 years ago, the original attraction was water. This well is where the amusement park uh, sprang from, yeah, as the, it were. The legend, the history, yeah. This natural spring attracted scores of nearby city dwellers eager for fresh water. Merchants and performers soon began entertaining the crowds, laying the foundation for amusement parks. It also inspired other cities to create their own escapist destinations. So that's a concept that just sort of blew my mind thinking about, you know, you're living in the, the cities in the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the quality of life isn't that great, especially if you can't get clean water. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of going to a park on the weekend to get clean water is just uh, unbelievable. Well, so, well it, it was more than that. It was also a place to kind of escape the... Uh, the, the, the inner city, and to, uh, there were pleasure gardens. It, was, it kind of serves the same purpose as, as public parks. It's, it's a way to sort of get away and be, am be among nature. Uh, and then over the years, those slowly evolved into, uh, they added amusements, and, and, uh, and that place, I believe, was Bakken in Denmark, yeah. which is the oldest uh, amusement park in the world. Um, and it, it exists to this day, and, and, and it has amusements, uh, amusement rides there. The history in this country, there's, there's all kinds of different um, ways that uh, amusement parks evolved in this country. As an example, um, I, I mentioned Revere Beach earlier. That was a seaside amusement park. Uh, kind of took its cue from Coney Island, which is sort of acknowledged as being the original amusement park in this country. Revere Beach followed not, not too long after. Um, but another uh, way that amusement parks evolved, uh, there were the trolley parks. And these were parks that were placed at the end of trolley lines. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day when we had trolleys, uh, they were the main source of transportation for people to get from where they lived uh, into where they worked. The trolley lines were sitting dormant on the weekends. And the trolley lines wanted to figure out a way that they could uh, increase ridership on the weekends. So they thought, what if we put a park at the end of the line? And, um, and that, uh, those became trolley parks. Um, at first they were just, again, sort of pleasure parks, they, they would have bandstands and beautiful flowers and perhaps a lake to go swimming and could play sports. But through the years, carousels were added and coasters were added. And there were only a handful of, amusement, of uh, trolley parks left in the country. I believe there were about eight or nine, one of which is Canopy Lake Park uh, in New Hampshire. Right. Um, yeah. That was, I believe, built in 1909. And uh, so it's, it's one of the remaining trolley parks in the country. Yeah, I can remember my father telling me about uh, growing up in Providence and you used to be able to get a, a trolley and go all the way up to Canopy Lake or uh, Revere Beach or any of the parks because all the trolley lines are connected. Mm -hmm. And it was a really uh, universal mass transportation system. Right. The other point you brought out <laughs> earlier was uh, I mentioned the magic word escape. And this seems to be a common theme to these things, is an escape from reality. Absolutely. That's really what parks are all about. Um, uh, it began many years ago in Bakken, where you're, you're, you're escaping the... The, uh, the drudgery the, of the, the city. The drudgery mm -hmm. of the city, yeah. right. 
now you know we we don't necessarily have uh, the conditions that uh, that they endured back in the industrial revolution but still theme parks serve a purpose of uh, it's a way to get away from everyday life and um, to immerse yourself in in sort of alternate realities um, not only getting clean water and fresh air and, yes. and sunshine and flowers but um, today's theme parks um, you can go and you can um, experience the adventures of Harry Potter or okay. Star Wars or you can fly with Peter Pan uh, so there are all these these uh, wonderful escapes that that uh, theme parks provide well that seems to be a kind of a recent innovation uh, I can remember when Disneyland and Disney World first opened up uh, they were uh, innovative in the sense that you never saw anybody but the characters and uh, they hired people to play the parts, to walk around the, play, the parks. And uh, they had the different areas of uh, international dining characteristics and villages like that. Then all of a sudden they started, like you said, the, the themes of the movies and trying to plow them back into the business. Yeah, yeah. Did they run out of uh, ideas like? Uh, well, well, no, I wouldn't say that. Movies have always been an important part. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Disneyland, uh, which opened in 1955, was a quantum leap um, away from amusement parks. It was a totally different concept. And Walt Disney was is is a true pioneer uh, in the industry. Um, he really took the techniques of filmmaking and adapted them to a three-dimensional space. Um, uh, that that he that eventually became known as the theme park. Um, so instead of going to the movies and seeing Peter Pan or Snow White or Cinderella, you could go to the park and you could see Snow White's castle. You could fly with Peter Pan. You could uh, meet Mickey Mouse. Uh, these people who were on TV or in movies. So it, it was really um, um, a, a conceptual leap. Um, the, the aspect of storytelling became very important in theme parks. Um, whereas amusement parks, uh, many of which still exist, are more about the thrill and the, just the experience of the ride itself. Yeah, the physical um, experience. Right, right. And, and the best theme park attractions kind of combine both. The, you'll have the storytelling aspect and you'll yeah. also have the thrilling aspect. Um, but you're also correct that more recently, um, the intellectual properties, uh, big, big budget um, properties like Star Wars and uh, Cars, uh, the movie Cars, and Harry Potter have really transformed the industry where um, the theme parks are building these um, incredibly immersive, richly detailed, very expensive um, lands that enable guests to immerse themselves into the worlds of Harry Potter. And coming in, in two years, uh, in 2019, Disneyland and Disney World are going to open up Star Wars lands, which are highly anticipated in the industry. That's going to be a, a game changer, I think. I remember when my kids were young, we took them down to Disney World, and the Magic Kingdom was wonderful, but uh, my favorite was Epcot. And they were in the process of, it was built, but they kept adding on and adding on and adding on, and it was amazing what they did with Epcot Center. Well, Epcot just celebrated its 35th anniversary, wow. and it's completely transformed. Um, Where does the time go? <laughs> I believe I was you reading... You must be having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading the other day that of the uh, original attractions, only one remains exactly the way it was on opening day. Yeah, right. And theme parks really have to evolve uh, in order to stay relevant yeah. and yeah. to uh, attract guests to come back. Sure. And so it's all about reinvesting and opening up new flashy attractions and whether uh, it be a new roller coaster at Six Flags or a new Star Wars land at, at <coughs> Disney World, that's, um, that's kind of the name of the game in the theme park industry. Well, you said you've been all over the world to these theme parks. Mm -hmm. You must have some favorites. I do. I do. Uh, people often ask me what my favorite is, and it, it, it's difficult for me to say because it's unfair in, in some regards to compare Canopy Lake, let's say, to <laughs> Disneyland. Or, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I love Canopy Lake as an example for its, its charm, the fact it's, its history, uh, the fact that it's a trolley park, that it's still there, and it has some wonderful rides, and it has an ambiance and a genuine uh, feeling of nostalgia that you can't really replicate. Um, so, but 
when pressed, uh, I will say that I love Disneyland uh, in California. Really? Uh, yeah, Better and than the, Disney and that's, World. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Disney World, of course, is is uh, there were there were four separate theme parks there, right? Uh, and a couple of water parks and all kinds of other things. Um, but when you're talking about the individual parks, um, I, I prefer Disneyland, the original theme park that Disney himself built and, and walked the streets. And there's a palpable sense of history there as well. Um, it just celebrated its 60th anniversary uh, not that long ago. And so um, it, although we sort of think of that as being a modern park, it, it's, mm. it's, it's uh, a genuine artifact itself at this point. Well, that's right in the city of Anaheim, is it not? Mm -hmm. Whereas Disney has acres and acres of land and, you know, it's kind of... You mean Disney World? You're talking about Disney the difference World. between yeah, Disneyland yeah, yeah. and Disney World? And it's sort of, you know, the, uh, the countryside uh, effect rather than being in the city and then there it is. Well, Walt Disney, when he built Disneyland, um, it was the country at the time. Was they, it? They, it was oh, okay. Orange Groves. Okay. And he always regretted when he saw the rampant development that oh. encroached around the park, all the, the, the motels and yeah. restaurants and, and everything. He, he, he thought if he ever did this again, he would buy so much land that that would never happen. And that's exactly what he did right. when he orchestrated uh, the purchase of land at, at Disney World. Um, it, it's, it's tens of thousands of acres, it's, uh, uh, it's an enormous place, and um, you drive into the property and it, you have to go a couple of miles before you get to the park, so uh, nothing encroaches there. So, right, yeah. right. But yeah. all sorts of transportation to get from one place to another is Right, that's the <clears> downside <throat> of it. It's, it's so sprawling that it's difficult to, to yeah, sort of move yeah. around easily. Yeah. Well, that's part of the game, to keep you there for a longer <laughs> period of time. If you go to Canopy Lake, you drive up there, you spend the afternoon, you drive home again, or take the trolley if you can find one. But you go to Disney World, Disneyland, uh, that's a week's exercise, or maybe two weeks. Yeah. So that's a major change, I think, in the, the concept of uh, just go away for a day as opposed to go away for a week or two weeks and take the whole family. Right, right. Um, Disney World more than Disneyland, that's definitely true. Um, they used to be sort of the only game in town, uh, the only place in town that was playing that game down in, in central Flo Florida. But uh, over the last few years, Universal has really stepped up its game. It's built multiple hotels. It built a second theme park. It just opened a water park this year. So they're really kind of neck and neck with each other. Um, fighting over the tourism dollars down in, in central Florida. Mm -hmm. And then there are other parks too. There's SeaWorld and there's Busch Gardens and uh, Legoland. So there are other parks competing for that tourist dollar down there. Well, yeah, it's a big game and everybody's got to get into it because mm -hmm. there's a lot of money there. And there is a lot of money. In spite of what they say, there's disposable income around. Um, <laughs> you mentioned you do a lot of traveling. You were showing me before the, uh, the show that was it an opening day ticket you got there? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I had the, the good fortune last year of going to uh, the grand opening of Shanghai Disneyland in China. I was one of um, a handful, I think there were five or six uh, um, U.S.-based um, journalists who were invited by Disney to attend the opening of Shanghai Disneyland. And um, so I, I, I got this um, commemorative opening day ticket. Uh, which I was uh, oh, very nice. fortunate to yeah. get. It's it's a uh, it's a paperweight. Yeah, and that's um, so that's that's uh, that that was kind of a nice memento, and it was a it was a wonderful park and and a, and a real adventure for me to go to uh, to Shanghai Disneyland. Well, how do they have to adjust the park or the theme for a different location like that? They've got uh, Disney's got parks in Europe too. Mm -hmm. Are they? Mirror images of Disneyland, Disney World, or how no. much do they adjust to the? Uh, there, are, there are other uh, Disneyland-style parks around the world, um, all of which follow the general formula that Walt Disney um, invented when he opened Disneyland in 1955. Shanghai Disneyland is, is quite different, though. It, it, there are echoes of the original Disneyland, but there are also things that are very unique about it. Um, and For instance? It, it both reflects the Chinese culture, um, and, and, and the different tastes that they have. 
Um, and it also was just an opportunity, I think, for the Imagineers, which is the, the name that Disney gives its, uh, the people who design the parks. It gave the Imagineers an opportunity to kind of start with a blank slate and, and, and come up with some, some new, new ideas. Um, there are lots of attractions that are not there. Um, when you enter the park, there is no Main Street USA for, for those of you who have been there. Well, but there is a, there is a, a, a street that looks like Main Street USA at uh, Disneyland Paris and uh, in, in Hong Kong and in Tokyo. Um, but they, they have, uh, instead, it's Mickey Avenue. And at Shanghai Disneyland. Oh, is that right? Yeah, Thank and the, the the streets are very wide. Um, some of the lands are missing. Many of the uh, classic attractions, like the Haunted Mansion, is are not there. So the, it was really an opportunity to kind of rethink the the classic Disney theme park. They do have a version of Pirates of the Caribbean there, which is uh, an extremely popular ride. Um, at all of the other Disney parks, but the one in Shanghai is, is extremely different. Um, I think it was uh, in the late 60s that the original Pirates of the Caribbean opened in California, and that was a unique uh, idea. It wasn't based on anything. It was, um, it, was, it was a story that the Imagineers came up with. That inspired the movies Pirates of the Caribbean, which became unbelievably well, popular. Well, it worked the other way around. And then in turn, yeah. the movies, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, inspired this new ride in, Disney, in, in Shanghai Disneyland in China that incorporates the Jack Sparrow character and uh, the characters from the films. And it is a radically different ride that uses um, large screen media and um, all kinds of other theme park trickery uh, that didn't exist back in the day when, mm. when Disney designed the original Pirates mm -hmm. of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful ride. It, it may be, uh, it's sort of neck and neck with my favorite attraction that I've ever been on anywhere. What's that? The, the, the Pirates of the Caribbean. No, in, in what's Shanghai, your Disney favorite ride. attraction? Well, there's that, and then there's also a, a ride called uh, Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey at uh, Universal Orlando that is obviously based on the Harry Potter films. Yeah. Um, it has ride vehicles on the end of robotic arms and again uses uh, the screen technology to kind of immerse you into the world of Harry Potter and these, these um, robotic vehicles are capable of, of incredible motion and so the, the motion combined with the uh, filmed scenes that you see make you feel like you're flying along with the characters. It's extremely well done and uh, so that that and the, and the Pirates of the Caribbean ride are my two favorites. Well, I was reading that uh, Disney tried to get J.K. Rowling to, um, to come to, to their park, mm -hmm. and they refused to give her creative control, so she went to Universal. I yeah, I don't know that that's necessarily been confirmed, but that certainly is yeah. the buzz that yeah. I've heard as well. And uh, uh, Universal gave um, her... Um, a great deal of creative control. Right. And uh, so um, when you go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which is what the lands are called in, in Florida uh, and California and Japan, um, they um, look starting, startingly like the movies. Uh, you really feel as if you've been transported to Hogsmeade and to uh, these fanciful places that she wrote about in her books and that were yeah. interpreted in the film. Well, she had control over the films when they were making the films mm -hmm. to make sure that they adhered pretty much to the book. Right. And they did. Right. And, I mean, they were a wonderful set of books. Yeah. And the movies were terrific as well. Right, right. I was reading about um, different theme parks. It got me interested to find uh, some of the, the odd things that they have throughout the world. And in China, they have um, a dwarf theme park. Have you ever been there? I have not been yeah. there. I'm not exactly sure what that park is. But. It's called Kingdom of the Little People. It okay. employs over 100 Chinese dwarves to sing and dance. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought, this is great. This is wonderful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another abandoned theme park in China called Wonderland that never opened. I don't know why. Uh, I didn't have time to, to delve into that, but I thought, gee, they built a whole park and never opened. Yeah. Must have cost a bundle. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah. Do you think they're ever going to get to a virtual reality in this thing? You just you go sit there, put on the helmet, and the whole thing is uh, portrayed in front of you? Well, that's actually a trend at theme parks right now. Um, well, isn't the, Epcot, don't they have there some are, of that? There are theme park attractions that incorporate virtual reality. This yeah. is a trend that we've been seeing over the last four or five years. There are actually roller coasters actual roller coasters where you wear virtual reality goggles oh, and so you combine the motion of the roller coaster with these virtual worlds <laughs> that you see in the goggles. Um, right here six, in uh, Massachusetts, Six Flags New England had it on uh, their, um, two of their coasters over the past couple of years where you could wear virtual reality goggles. And um, there, um, I was just on a roller coaster at SeaWorld uh, in Orlando uh, that also incorporates <coughs> virtual reality. Next year, there's going to be a motion simulator attraction at Busch Gardens Williamsburg that will incorporate virtual reality. So mm -hmm. this is actually a trend that you just that you just yeah. hit on. Well, it all sounds like a lot of fun when you just go to all these parks. And uh, I'd like to roll the uh, third clip now, if you would, because after this all done, you got to come home and do your homework, right? That's right interviews that I have to do, I have photographs that I have to take, I have stories that I have to write with word counts. But it ends up you get, still get to go on the ride. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I guess we're running down on the time and uh, I guess really would like to know if you had to go on a vacation right now, where would you go? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's well, quite a question. Fortunately, <laughs> I, I have the opportunity to sort of constantly visit theme yeah. parks. I'm going to be going in a few weeks back down to Florida to, to look at some other things down there. If so, you weren't doing it for work and fun and profit, yeah, yeah. where would you go? Um, are you talking about related to theme parks or not necessarily? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's open, wide open. Yeah, well, Do you um, ever get tired of them? <laughs> I, I, do, I don't get tired of theme parks, but it is my job. Sure. So, so, yeah. so it, is, it is work, and that's sort of what I was alluding to in that clip. Yeah. A lot of people think I'm just sort of running around having all this fun, and I am. <laughs> um, but there's, there's, a, there's a work aspect to this as well. If, um, if I had no um, assignments tied to, uh, to, to, to anything, um, I, all things being equal, I think one of the, the, the place that I've enjoyed the most uh, my wife and I have visited Hawaii a couple of times, and I just fell in love with the place. And um, so that's probably a place I'd love to return to. There's no to. theme park there? There actually, uh, Disney has a resort. There isn't a theme park, but Disney does have a, a wonderful resort there. There is a water park, uh, but there is no major theme park there. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've had an interesting discussion and would like to uh, have everybody take a deep breath while we run the fourth clip. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you again next time. Thanks again.